What is going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. We've got uh, kind of a more, uh, I'd say, structured stream uh, to, to go over today. Um, you know, I, as it says in the title, we're going to be actually going through the menu system on the S5 Mark II. Uh, I, I've gotten a lot of people asking questions like, hey, where's this in the menu? Can you explain this? Um, so we wanted to, you know, just be able to take the time, go through this, um, partially because this becomes an archive and a resource for people that may want to look for something later on. Um, I promise this particular stream, I'll actually make sure to try to go through and timestamp everything so that like, we kind of know where we're talking about from photo video to hybrid, um, throughout the menu system. So yeah, I, uh, we're going to be covering all of that kind of stuff. Uh, as usual, if you have questions, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras or Lumix USA in the chat, um, so that I can see them. We can kind of go through them. Um, but yeah, we'll be using the S5 Mark II as the kind of, uh, primary camera to be talking about with all this, but pretty much everything that we're going to go through is going to be relevant to any of the newer cameras that are on this particular style of menu. So that would be the entire S series cameras, the, uh, newer G series cameras. So like the GH, um, that, that line of cameras will all be within this platform. So, uh, if you have questions again, as I said, make sure to tag them in the, the comments there. Um, if you're new to these streams, these are weekly broadcasts that we do every Thursday at 2 PM Eastern time. Uh, talking about tech, uh, into the, the camera details. I keep looking off camera. Like you can see my S5 Mark II, but I know you can't. Uh, yeah, we talk about tech, we have guests come on every once in a while, uh, and yeah, this is just a community for all of you to be able to chat with us, get questions asked, get some answers to them, uh, sometimes we can get to them during a stream, sometimes we can't, and that helps us build out, uh, future broadcasts that may be specific about a per like a certain topic that you're looking to want to cover. So, if you have those kinds of questions, or those, uh, recommendations for future topics you want to see, drop them in the comments after this video posts. Uh, and then, yeah, we can, uh, build future streams for stuff like that. Um, before we go too far into this, I want to remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services. We have red and platinum here in the United States. Red is free. If you've bought a new camera, make sure to go take a look at Lumix Pro Service. You can follow the QR code on the screen or the link down in the description. Uh, get yourself registered. Um, if you're somebody who likes, you know, like that next level of service and support, make sure you take a look at the platinum series. Platinum service, I believe is $199 here in the U.S., uh, and that comes with two-day repairs with next-day shipping both ways. You get 20% off out of warranty repairs if you drop or break something. Um, you also get an exclusive member hotline. So if you want to talk to somebody instead of going through emails and chat, you have access to that as well. Uh, same with sensor cleanings, lens calibrations, firmware updates, all that fun stuff to keep your equipment in top shape for your seasons. So be sure to take a look at those. Uh, we have links in the description for all the different areas there. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, I saw a couple, uh, comments come through. So let me see here. Uh, Cliff says, Hey, how's it going, Cliff? Um, waiting on the S5 II X. Will the X have every single feature in the S5 Mark II has, or will the X be missing anything at all? No, the S5 Mark II X will have every single thing that the S5 Mark II has, plus the all intra ProRes recording, uh, raw over HDMI is included out of the box. Uh, and it will also have the live streaming functionality. So similar to like what we've done on the GH5 Mark II. Um, so you'll have all of those. The S5 Mark II, uh, the one that we're using the demo with, will only be getting raw over HDMI as a firmware update uh, through the paid solution. So the SFU upgrade uh, option. Um, you don't get all intra, you don't get ProRes on the S5 Mark II base model. You have to go to the Mark II X if you know that you're going to need uh, ProRes or all intra, stuff like that. Um, and as a reminder, that pretty much the reason for that is it's choice. There's a lot of people that have no need for some of those recording uh, codecs. And at that point, you don't have to pay for it. Um, so you can get the base one. People like to play with RAW and work with it since it's an external solution. Um, so that's why you've got that. Uh, both cameras will be getting uh, Live View Composite. Uh, Live View Composite is going to ship with the S5 Mark II X, and then the firmware update on the S5 Mark II should be coming right about the same time uh, to add Live View Composite and that Raw over HDMI uh, kind of update there. So that's really the differences between them. Um, 
As a relatively good segue, then, um, I also want to just kind of remind everybody, if you've got an S5 Mark II or you've picked one up already, uh, make sure to head over to the link I just dropped in the chat. We did just update the uh, firmware on the S5 Mark II. It is a minor firmware update. This is not a, this is not a major one, um, so if you were looking for certain things, uh, this is a, a different uh, uh, reason that we're updating the camera here. Um, this one in particular updated the way the camera presents the uh, image on the back of the camera when you're in burst photography modes. Um, so it speeds up the system. You have the choice to do speed priority or image quality priority. Um, so this just sped up the way burst shooting uh, works on the particular camera. So uh, yeah, so be sure to go take a look, get yourself downloaded. Um, it's always good to keep your cameras upgraded, um, especially as stuff comes out, even if it's not necessarily relevant to you. It takes a couple of minutes, uh, and we do it over the SD card, so you're not worried about having to make sure software is compatible and all that fun stuff. Um, let's see here. Uh, give us your NAB plans. Any cool hints for us? Will you be streaming live from NAB? Uh, I had wanted to stream live from NAB, but unfortunately... Um, just a combination of challenges because I arrive on the 13th and I leave on the 20th from that show. It's both on Thursdays. It just kind of causes a headache. So, uh, the two streams for the week of, uh, NAB are going to be pre-recorded. Um, as far as, uh, in the booth, not really much I can tell you. Uh, we'll have S5 Mark IIs. We'll have the S5 Mark II X there. It will be under glass. Uh, and then we will have um, some box cameras and some other solutions there as well as some of the camcorders too. So if you're going to be in Las Vegas for NAB, come by, see the booth. We're in the Panasonic Connect booth. Um, same place we were last year, right in the Central Hall. Uh, but yeah, come by, see Matt, uh, Matt Neil, and I. Uh, we'll be there the entire show. Uh, let's see here. Uh, would it be possible to have an update to the S5 II to fix the slightly magenta skin tones? I have taken a few photos and noticed it. Um, I wouldn't know if something like that would be firmware updated. Um, it, it, it's honestly, it's the first time I've run into anything saying about skin tones on on uh, being magenta for photos. Um, granted, I use very different uh, ways, like work with my camera, but you'd have to be able to kind of see with the rest of the team, you know, because if in, if only a certain group of people are saying like, Hey, you know, I see this particular look, but the vast majority aren't, you have to weigh out whether or not that's something that does need to be fixed or it's a more, um, not niche, but it's maybe not as high up on the priority list of things to, to firmware update. So it's, we, we definitely will take a look if, if we see some, some differences there, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, uh, bring it up to the engineering team. Uh, can you tell us if you have used the S5 Mark II X yourself? Um, well, I do work for the company, so yeah, I, I've I've had some hands-on with it while we're getting it prepared to be launched. Um, outside of that, can't say anything to you. Um, can we skip it? Uh, can we skip it without issue or wait for the live view composite firmware update? You can of course, um, you know, pass on this firmware update if you're not, you know, in in the mood to to download a firmware update. When you go to the new um, firmware update, um, so like as we release them, so this one is 1.1. When we release the next one, it's going to include everything that's in the previous updates. So you don't have to update within normal, um, you know, kind of cadence there. So you're good there. Um, uh, Steve says, I've been meaning to ask, I'm um, having a bug with the back button focusing in, uh, HS2 photo and AFC. If I hold the button, uh, focus down, trigger the shutter, I can't press the shutter again. Uh, could, uh, I will take a look at that, uh, Steve. Uh, could you briefly go through the external recording options in the S5 without an Atomos or other recorded that's hundreds of dollars? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna go over that actually in a moment, uh, when I switch over to the camera and we go through the menus there. Um, make sure I got most of these questions here so we can jump in. Um, doesn't happen in the normal multi-shot, uh, speed mode. Okay. Um, that's that one. Wondering if it can record raw. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if it can record raw to the Ninja 5 Plus with the S5 II. Haven't been able to find a form explaining it. I'm new to videography, by the way. Okay, CJ. So that's actually a, a good point then. Let's, um, let's jump over here to my S5 Mark II. So... I have the S5 Mark II hooked up here. We're running over HDMI. Uh, and so we're 
gonna basically kind of take this as like a, a step by step, right? To go through the menus, um, makes it easier for people to be able to go back into something and kind of figure out what you want. So since a lot of the questions have been, uh, leaning towards video, we're going to go through the video options first, then we'll go through photo and then we'll go into some of the other, um, kind of miscellaneous options here. But, uh, some of the stuff, um, that we want to cover that maybe just isn't really just kind of the normal stuff. You know, everyone knows exposure mode. You go in here, this tells you, uh, if I actually put the camera into the video mode, um, the, uh, exposure mode uh, option here. This just tells you a, a PASRM. So if you're someone who's been going into the camera and you're like, hey, I want to be in aperture and I want to shoot video, but I don't know why I don't have access to these different menu options because one, you got to be in creative video mode and two, you select your exposure mode through this menu here. So uh, PASRM, 90% uh, of the time, people typically leave it in M. Um, your photo styles, this is the the more deep involved option for photo styles. So if you're looking to tweak a photo style, so say you're someone who likes to work with, say, Cinelike D, but you like to pull all the sharpening out or you know shift maybe some of the contrast, this is where you're going to set that up in the camera is actually through the main camera system menu. If you were to use the quick menu, um, and then go into here, you notice you don't have choice, uh, for changing or altering these, uh, particular options. So I got to this menu just by clicking the Q menu button. Um, so when we go back in here, I said each of these, you have the option to come in here and change these different, uh, parameters for it. And something to note when you make a change to a profile, um, like right now I just dropped the sharpening to negative one. If I save this, and then come out and click the Q menu button, you notice that in right below me, so right below here, you'll see it says Cine D2, and then it has a little asterisk on that particular display. That is telling you that that is not a stock, out of the box version of the profile that's designed. So that means that one of those different parameters has been changed. Um, if you're not sure what has been changed by default out of the box, you have these different controls here to change those particular parameters. But if you've already customized your, your quick menu, and we'll show you how to do that in a minute. Um, the asterisk, as I said, is a way to understand like, Hey, this profile has been altered. It's not just default out of the box. Um, so if I come back here and I change this back to zero, you'll see when I go to here, it's back to, there's no asterisk there. So, um, Underneath that, uh, this is one that I've seen actually a lot of people asking questions about is the metering modes on our cameras. So we have four metering modes on the S series cameras now. Uh, evaluative metering or full area, center weighted spot, and then highlight spot metering. One of the uh, reasons why I'm, why I'm bringing this particular one up, even though, you know, honestly, metering modes are fairly similar across the board these days. There's not really all that much secret sauce going into it anymore, despite what marketing tells you. Um, coming from a marketer, uh, with, with these different modes, it's going to depend on, on the, the scenario that you're, you're using in, um, recently ran across a situation where a video user was running into problems where the camera, when they would bring it up, even though they were using spot metering or thought they were using spot metering, everything was getting ultra dark. And what it turned out to be is that instead of spot metering, which is just the dot in the middle. They were using highlight spot metering. Now highlight spot metering, what it is designed to do is make sure that even though you're using spot, which is going to be the center of the, the frame, or you can tie it to a focus point if you want. Um, it's going to make sure that no highlights are blown in the image at all. Um, so that can be useful. It can be very useful in certain situations, but if you're ever, you know, shooting and you're like, okay, the metering just is not making any sense. All my highlights are really, really dark or they're floating around middle gray and they're not actually like getting bright no matter what you do to the camera, or you're finding yourself having to put in a lot of exposure compensation to, to get a look you want, double check your metering. Um, it's possible that, that this can be changed. Um, if, to, you know, depending on going through the menus, if you're playing around with it, learning your camera, um, a lot of times you'll see that these, these options can get changed, but they're easily forgotten because you rarely ever change these often. Um, if you're looking to just be able to get a, a general use for metering on the cameras, 
I typically prefer going to center weighted uh, metering for my options, but you can also do stuff like the multi metering and then tie in face evaluative uh, metering for it as well. Um, but center weighted is usually what I end up working with. Um, now on the S5 Mark II, we also have the dual native ISO uh, system on this camera. So this allows you to go auto, low, and high. Auto, the camera's going to function like the original S5 does, where it will automatically change over the gain circuitry um, when it hits that particular point. So it'll take into account the uh, color profile that you're in, the mode that you're in, if you're in photo or video, um, and then it, it adjusts it accordingly. If you set this to low, some of the things you'll notice is one, look at how dark that image got. So I can choose low 100, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit, um, down to 200, which is the base ISO for uh, this particular uh, option here. Um, we'll see that I'm in Cinelite D2, so 200 uh, ISO is the lowest range for that. Um, but it'll only let me go up to 1600 in this case. But if I were to change the color profile, so let's change this to like Vlog, the one that most of you are probably using. Ah, and my early production camera has crashed. Isn't that fun? Um, cool. So if we're here and I go into my ISO settings here, you'll see that as I'm going through here in Vlog, the number's changed now. So my lowest rating here is 640 in the native range. And then the highest here lets me go up to 5,000 for this particular setup. But if I go in and then now change my um, ISO settings to high, you'll see that when I go in here, now my lowest range is 4,000 uh, 4, and then it goes up all the way to 51,200. So your ISO range selection gives you a lot of control for how you want the actual image to look. Um, out of the box, this is going to be an auto, uh, you have that, that kind of ability to change it where you want. Uh, and then what I can also show you too, is that we've talked about this in a real time LUT, uh, stream as well, that if I go into something like, um, the, my profile, uh, options here, my, my photo styles, you can also unlock the ability here to, uh, to basically apply a native ISO range to the particular color profile that you're in. So in this case, my Provia profile here uh, is set where dual ISO is set to auto, ISO is set to auto, basically everything is set to auto. But I can come in and say, you know, hey, I want this to always be in high. Um, I'm based in the standard profile and I want my ISO to basically always just, you know, start at say uh, 640 since that's the photo native ISO. Um, and I want my auto white balance to be cool since this is mimicking Fujifilm. Uh, I can then go in, save this, uh, save current setting to Provia, overlay it. Now, what it means is that every time I go in, if I change this to say my LUT 2, you'll see that my ISO is, uh, well, let's change it here. If I bring my ISO up to say 10,000, uh, my white balance is set to day. Uh, my ISO is set to 12,800. But now if I come in here and I change this back to my one, all those settings went back. It's auto white balance cool. It's in ISO 640. If I go into my ISO range, you see that I'm in the high range only. Um, so you, you have some, some parameters that you can set so that you've always got a good uh, basic setup for, for different styles of shootings. It's another way to just program the camera so that you don't necessarily have to worry too much about um, just your exposure settings. Instead of necessarily running through and setting up C1, C2, C3, you can do this with the uh, color profile dependent as well. Uh, it's continuing further, like I said, ISO sensitivity in video. This is where you can set your uh, lower and upper limits uh, depending on the mode that you're in. So this will change depending on what your dual native uh, menu option is. ISO sensitivity, you'll see I can go down all the way to 100. Uh, and then I can set my upper limit to say, I never want the camera to go above 6,400. Now it'll, it'll set it here so that if I turn my camera into auto ISO, you'll see in the bottom, this exposure is calling for 6,400. But even if I half press, it's giving me the, the correct overall exposure. My shutter is way off though. Uh, so at 180 degree, 6,400 ISO, F2.8, I've got my exposure set up. So uh, another level of just kind of customization that you've got built into it. 
Uh, synchro scan in the camera, if you've never used it before, synchro scan is what allows you to be able to fine tune your uh, shutter degree or your uh, your shutter just speed uh, by pretty much one degree increments. Um, there are some where it'll jump uh, maybe two or three degree, um, but this lets you go in there and fine tune for situations where you've got flickering lights or say you're setting up a video um, and you're running into situations where the cycle rate of the TV is causing an issue or the lights that you've got. This lets you fine tune it so you don't have to go like all the way down to say like a 45 degree angle or a 360 degree angle and really mess with your motion cadence. Um, you've got fine tune control in here for it. Usually you don't have to go too far off your 180 degree here uh, to get to a point where you're not going to have to worry about lights flickering. Um, but yeah, synchro scan built into the camera gives you that full control. You can toggle it on and off and you can program it into uh, different pl uh, positions that you may want for the camera. Uh, flicker decrease. So flicker decrease is more of a, an automatic mode for the camera when it comes to video. So if you are in creative video mode, you're not going to have an option for this. That's what synchro scan does. Uh, flicker decrease just basically is a very simple, straightforward way to do it, uh, where it just basically shifts by larger groups, um, to get to a shutter speed that doesn't have the flicker in the frame when it detects it. Um, so if you are in creative video mode and you notice like, Hey, why can't I select fl uh, flicker decrease? That's why it's more of an auto mode. If you're in the photo options, trying to record video, this is, that's where this is going to help you. Uh, master pedestal. Uh, if you want to match black levels to different cameras, there you go. Uh, if you've never used master pedestal before, or you're just playing around with it, uh, be very careful because you can truly ruin your footage. If you don't know what you're doing with master pedestal, um, because this does just adjust black levels uh, on the camera, but it's designed for matching black levels to other camera systems. Uh, if you're in like a multi-camera environment, uh, shutter speed and gain operation angle and ISO. If you've ever, uh, you know, kind of got into the camera and you're like, okay, Hey, I, I know I'm going to be jumping between 60, 24, 30 frames per second, 120 frames per second. Um, setting your camera to angle and ISO is going to be a big help since right now, um, as I set my cameras up right out of the box every time I get them, when you set it to angle and ISO, you never have to worry about if I'm changing frame rates to make sure that my shutter speed is set to the correct uh, interval for that frame rate. Um, angle at 180 degrees means that if I jump from 24, it's going to be at a 48 frame per second. If I jump to 60, it's going to be at 120 frame per second, 30 uh, or 29.97. It'll be at the equivalent doubling of that particular frame rate. Uh, so this makes it like super easy and straightforward for jumping frame rates. Uh, it is also a pretty good habit to just get into working in shutter angle if you've never done it before, um, because you'll realize how much less you have to really kind of worry about uh, in your shutter speeds. You're less likely to come back from a shoot where say you're mixing frame rates. Say you wanted to do 60p footage for a 24p timeline or a 30p timeline because you're going to do slow-mo. You don't have to really sit there and wonder or realize when you get back that, hey, I shot that 60p footage, but at 50th of a second, so I'm pretty much at a full 360 degree, and now my motion blur looks like garbage when I go to slow it down, or it doesn't look the way I want it to look. Um, this will save your butt a lot of times uh, if you're someone who jumps frame rates a lot. You also have um, seconds and decibels in here, so if you're somebody who works more from the video side of the world, um, and I mean like the camcorder, uh, you know, kind of production like that. Um, you do also have the ability to use decibels instead of ISO. So zero DB and then gain up from there. Um, really just choices for how people want to use the camera. Uh, vignetting compensation, uh, in our cameras by default, it's going to be off. Uh, if you are shooting in vlog, make sure this is off. Um, it's on because there are some, like it, it has the ability to be turned on, uh, even in vlog, because there are some times where people just want vignetting compensation turned on and may not be super heavily grading footage. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, when you're really going to be pushing and pulling footage, you want to have as little, you know, kind of software stuff done to that footage typically. Um, so if you're someone who's going to be shooting vlog and you know, you're going to be working with, um, you know, native lenses, cause this only works with native lenses. Um, I recommend turning vignetting compensation off. It is off out of the box. Um, so you can be able to just go in there and double check. 
New to the S5 Mark II is color shading compensation. So this in particular is a new option for the S5 Mark II that came from the addition of things like phase detect in the camera. So if you've got a bunch of different lenses and you like the way some of these lenses work, you can come in here and adjust the way the tint works um, for the different lenses. So this, this allows you to kind of shift the image across the board so that you can get a neutral look across multiple different lenses. And there's other tools we have in there for this as well. Um, but this is, it, it's another tool for being able to match um, images that may come from different optics and every optic may have its own different kind of rendering. Um, so yeah, you've got uh, some, some shading options there. Uh, and if you're ever curious more details about these, if you ever click the display button uh, on the camera, it gives you this kind of stuff, but uh, like information as to what these menus are. So this is compensates the color of peripheral parts of the image. So this is where your edge um, periphery would be and adjusting the color and shading compens uh, compensation there. Uh, let's see here. I just saw a couple uh, comments come through. Um, my camera keeps saying that LUT's not registered when I try to load it on camera. Could you tell me why this is happening? Uh, Wes, yes, I'm going to get to that actually in a moment when I talk about LUTs in general, because there's a couple, I think, there's a couple points that, that are most likely the cause if you're running into problems where it says it can't load them. Um, let's see here. Small Brown Fox, uh, I know you give nothing away, but as a former EVA 1 user and owner of several S bodies, I need to know if you're planning an update of an EVA line. I need more IO uh, than S cameras offer. Well, you know that I can't give anything away. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have any answer I can give you. I'm sorry, Small Brown Fox. Um, let's see here, where were we? Um, diffraction compensation. Again, if you're someone shooting in V-Log, probably good to just leave this off. Um, but what diffraction compensation does is it knows at what point lenses typically provide diffraction, um, given the sensor size and the iris opening. Um, and then it can intelligently be able to reapply, you know, a correction for the softness that you get with, um, uh, diffraction compensation by default. Again, these are typically off in the camera, but you have them as a tool in case you want to play around with them. Uh, a lot of times these can be more useful if you're someone on the photography side than on the video side. Um, since on the photo side with real time LUT and the baked in LUT, uh, look capabilities, this can be nice to, you know, kind of minimize how much time you have to go into post for things like vignetting correction, or in this case, sharpening based because of diffraction, uh, filter settings. Exactly what they say. Uh, filter settings are all of those baked in, you know, retro, old days, high key, low key, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're built into the camera. You have the ability to come in here, turn them on. You also have the ability to simultaneously record without filter, depending on where you are. We're in the video options. So, um, you know, it, it just gives you some, some different looks to the images. Uh, if you're doing any kind of like heavy uh, actual editing or work, Probably shy away from these because they're going to bake into the footage that you're working with. Uh, now to the big ones. Rec file format, MOV, MP4. Which one to choose, when to work with them. Uh, MOV is going to get you all the highest end capabilities of the S5 Mark II. Um, this is where you have access to all the way up to your full HD 120. Um, this is also where if I go into display, I change this and go to any. <clears throat> Hit display again. This is where you can go in, select all the way up to the 6K 30P option, which is going to be open gate. Um, so you're using the full sensor height and width in a three by two aspect ratio. Um, MOV just gives you more options. If you need this camera to be able to record in eight bit footage, because for some reason you need an eight bit uh, output for your file, this is where you would have to change to MP4. MP4 is going to give you, when you go into the menus, this is where you'll see you have options for 8-bit. Um, there's only eight options for 8-bit in the camera. So you have 24, 30, um, 60 uh, in full HD, 24, 30, uh, and 60, or 24 and 30 in um, 4K. So you, you actually have six options. Um, but there is 8-bit in the camera for those that, that need it. Um, if you know you're not going to be doing a lot of editing, uh, MP4 is also a lower bit rate option. So these are going to be typically 72 megabit to hundred megabit or 20 and 24. 
Um, so if you know that you're going to be doing work to the footage, I do not recommend shooting an MP4. Um, you want higher bit rates so that the footage can be pushed and pulled. Um, and in general, MOV, especially with uh, most hardware for editing these days, it can handle MOVs without a problem. Um, you can convert them if you need to, uh, but that's going to get you the best quality. Uh, next up, we have image area of video. This lets you choose between full APS-C and pixel to pixel. Uh, to note here, this is the option that you'll see that will get limited as you change some of these different modes. So if I want to go up to record uh, 4K 60p, um, so if I come up here and let's say I want to go 4K, uh, let's filter this out to 60p, hit display. So if I wanted to jump to 60p, you'll see here that um, it says MOV and then it has a comma and it says APS-C. So what this means is that that mode is only available in the APS-C option. When you change to that particular resolution and frame rate in that combination, you'll see that it, full will be blocked out, um, but you would still have the option to go pixel to pixel, which lets you crop in even further to get a better look of an image uh, or more reach if you need it. So you've got um, a lot of different combinations available all between these three particular menus here. Uh, rec quality, my list, um, because I have the HDMI hooked up to it and the way that I've got my camera configured, I can't go into this um, at the moment. But what you would basically be doing uh, is say I really like shooting at full HD 30p here. I would hit Q and I can add that to the menu. Uh, if I wanna go in here and say, hey, uh, you know, I want 6K open gate. Uh, added in here as well at 30p. I would click display again, go to yes. Now what you'll notice is my rec quality is visible. So now that I've altered the way I have my camera normally set up, when I go into here, just the options that I have added to this menu are now visible within this particular menu. This means I don't have to dive through all the different options to figure out, hey, where's that one frame rate and uh, uh, resolution combo that I really like? I'm always wanting to be able to jump between a couple of them so I can set it here. The cool thing is that if you are coming from something like a GH6, uh, the GH6 does also have the ability to mix the different uh, codecs. So I can come in and say, hey, you know, I want to come in and change this to MP4. And then I want to be able to say, hey, I want 10 bit, you know, 72 megabit, 24p. I want to add that to the option as well. Well, now if I come here, go back to MOV, say yes to proceed. In this list, you will also have the ability to say, okay, I want to mix my MP4, my MOVs, which means when we get to cameras like the GH6 or the S5 Mark II X, um, the ability to say, hey, I want my ProRes codecs, my all intra codecs, my MOV and my MP4 codecs. I want all the ones that I use in those different areas saved into one menu. So now I've got it. I don't have to you know, dig and dive through the different menus. Um, we do have the filtering solution in here um, that does make it a little bit easier because I can just click display and say, you know, which codec do I want to work with. Um, but it, it makes it just a little bit easier to keep things cleaner uh, for your particular style of shooting. Uh, slow and quick settings. Uh, slow and quick is the built-in option for high-speed filming on the S-Series cameras or on the S5 Mark II and the S5 platform. Uh, slow and quick, really, it is a more basic version of variable frame rate. Uh, this allows me to go in and say, hey, I am picking, say, 24p as my output, uh, which gets selected up here in rec quality. But then under the slow and quick option, this is where you now select and say, hey, I want to shoot at, you know, 60 frames per second, but I'm outputting at 24. I want to shoot at 120 frames per second, but I want to output at 24. This will give you pre-slowed down footage. Um, the cool thing with the slow and quick on the S5 Mark II uh, is that this is also a 10-bit recording option now, where on previous cameras from us, slow and quick was always 8-bit. Um, so you do get more flexibility with it, more usability for grading and post if you're someone who really likes to use Vlog for this. Um, so it does give you uh, another level of control for it. Uh, time code. Uh, pretty straightforward timecode display. This gives you the option to see the timecode on the camera. But if you're someone who's going to be recording to an external device, uh, this is where you want to make sure timecode is turned on. You want to make sure HDMI timecode output is on. 
And then you also have to go into your HDMI output and turn uh, HDMI rec control on as well. That'll allow you to go out there and trigger your recorder because on the top left of my display, uh, you see that the uh, auto white balance continuous right below that is HDMI and then the, the little uh, pause icon. That's telling me that the camera's ready to have an HDMI device attached and trigger that device to record as long as that device is set up to receive uh, triggering over HDMI. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, bu 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 see here, Chad, when I film with real-time LUT to bake in a look, the footage has less contrast for supplying the same LUT to vlog footage in Resolve. Why does real-time LUT uh, look different uh, from applying the LUT in post? So in this particular case, you have to look at how that LUT was created. Um, there are some LUTs, uh, depending on where you're supposed to use them, correction LUTs, things like that. Um, that will respond differently when you put them in a camera versus when you put them in software. Uh, some of the early uh, LUTs that got created, um, and if you look over on the Facebook group, uh, Nick Driftwood does a really good job at um, basically working on the Facebook group about real-time LUT. Uh, it could be down to things like what color space was that LUT created in? Uh, is it 709? Was it created? Is it was it created based off photo or was it created in video? How was it generated? What um, uh, accuracy is it? Is it a 66, 33? Um, in the camera, you don't go over 33. Um, you can load larger ones in there, but you really shouldn't. Um, 33 point LUT to bake into it. Some of the other differences there can be down to uh, the way your software is interpreting the log footage when you bring it in. Um, so it, it, there's a couple different ways you have to look at it. Uh, but in general, uh, real-time LUT should be a direct uh, uh, way to just bake the footage in. Uh, uh, with the exception of the fact that some software, just how it's rendering the footage. Premiere can handle it different than Final Cut, First Resolve, things like that. Especially when it comes to new cameras, some of the software needs to catch up and make sure that it's actually doing what it's supposed to when you bring log footage in. Um, let's see here. Um, does Panasonic publish a lens roadmap for the new and updated micro four thirds and full frame lenses? Uh, we have on the global site, uh, we do have what, uh, kind of, uh, uh, lenses are, are coming. Uh, so you can take a look at that. It's on, it's, you just Google Panasonic global, uh, and you'll be able to see it. Um, I don't know if there's anything posted there for Micro Four Thirds, though. Um, let's see here. Chad says, I was using Nice 709 from Panasonic. Uh, okay. Uh, I will take a look at that, um, and see. Uh, the Nice 709 LUTs, uh, if you look at the ones online that are designed for the Vericam, um, I do just have to double check. They are generally across the board compatible between S-Series, Vericam, and Micro Four Thirds. Um, the only difference between any of those different cameras is going to be dynamic range. So the LUTs shouldn't be causing a problem with that, but, um, I will check with a couple of the, my, my guys here to see, um, if they notice any difference there. Um, but also let me know which of the LUTs you've downloaded and are trying to load into the camera. Uh, let's see here. Are there any plans to expand the L-mount lens options? I'm interested in the S5 Mark II for a weird mix of uses, concert, photo, portrait, landscape, maybe some Milky Way astrophotography. Um, yeah, I mean, the L-mount lens solution is is expanding all the time. Um, the thing that I think people are, are forgetting is that... Oh, I sorry, Small Barn Fox. I will... Did I drop? Where did I miss question? Uh, would you recommend a GH6 or S5 Mark II X for YouTube music video? Uh, how fast are you moving? Uh, I think it's Leo. If you're moving a lot, if you're very active on camera, probably the S5 Mark II or Mark II X. Uh, if you're more static, you know, kind of just in one place, uh, GH6 or any of the other cameras from the uh, DFD solution will be perfectly fine. Um... I used them for three and a half years and never had a problem for YouTube. Um, Small Brown Fox, which question did I miss for you? Um, I know I didn't miss the question that you asked, so if I missed, please rephrase it. 
um, because I only saw one question from you. Uh, okay, where was it? Uh, are there any plans to expand the L-mount lens options? Uh, I'm interested in the S5 Mark II for a weird mix of uses. Uh, S5 Mark II, or the um, L-mount lenses are constantly being updated. Um, the uh, entire line of lenses uh, from Leica, Sigma, and Panasonic are all considered first party. So it's not just that one brand has to cover every single, every single lens right away. Um, all of us are working on different... Um, uh, are basically working on different, uh, uh, focuses, right? Each of us have our own, you know, kind of idea and our own look that we would like to see. Uh, but, uh, if, if there's a lens you're looking for or a focal length, it's going to be already available somewhere within the Elman Alliance between Sigma, Leica, and Panasonic. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is always expanding here. Marco says, I feel like the Lumix color pipeline is broken. If I interpret the raw file as vlog picture profile in Photoshop, this doesn't match a vlog frame captured with the same settings of video. Of course it's not going to. Um, raw photo files have infinitely more dynamic range, and they're either going to be an sRGB or Adobe RGB. They're not encoded in vGamut or vlog. Um, so... Yeah, of course. If if you if you take a raw file in vlog and bring it into Adobe Camera Raw, it's not going to to work for you um, because now you're taking something where you're trying to out you're trying to take a LUT or create a LUT. Say if you do this and then you put it in, you edit it, make it look the way you want, but then you bring it in the camera, you notice it's different. Well, it's because the file that you created is based in sRGB or Adobe RGB. And it's been created with a raw file, which is 14-bit, which has more dynamic range capabilities because it was a raw file, than at most a 10-bit, you know, vlog file in camera. Um, if you are going to generate LUTs for the camera, typically, well, yes, you can do this in the photo sense for photo applications, but if you do it the other way, create a LUT off a photograph for video, it's a lot more complicated to make sure that you are also outputting it in the right gamut. Um, you're making sure that you're outputting it, you know, based on the right actual look that you're trying to go for. But this is one of the biggest reasons why we tell everybody, if you capture raw still images, do not shoot in vlog. Vlog for raw is not really that useful. It compresses dynamic range. It's not the same as vlog for video. Um, if you do it, use the JPEG image to try to do it. It's going to be closer, but even then it's only an 8-bit. Um, the best way to do it is to create um, a short video clip, grade that clip, and then export out the look you want from there, and then load it into the camera. Um, so hopefully that helps, Marco. Um, but I know that that's a, that's a point that a lot of people are getting wrong online when it comes to how to create LUTs for uh, the camera. All right, small brown fox. Okay, I see. Um, wasn't really worded as a question, but um, trying to see where it was because it, it this wasn't a question, um, but it's a comment. Um, would like to see an S Pro thirty five f one four one point two or fifty one four is a the fifty one four is a beauty. Yeah, so I mean the 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 S Pro line, you know, we like I said, we are always looking to expand uh, the lineup. It's a matter of just figuring out what lenses make the most sense to upgrade, um, and then in line what makes the most sense. But um, S Pro lenses, but okay, uh, Sigma are fine, but I only buy first party lenses. Um, that's the trick. In L mount, Sigma is first party. Sigma, Leica, and Panasonic are first party. Um, it's hard to believe. But all three manufacturers are first party in the Elmont Alliance, which means when you take a Sigma lens, put it on a Lumix camera, it is first. It is a first party. Um, sorry. Yeah, smaller fox. That's just why I didn't notice the question here. Um, okay. Scott Perry, when I connect to Godox trigger, I can't take bursts, only single shot. Even if I set to manual, was hoping this would be fixed on an S5 Mark II. Any word? Uh, I, I don't believe that's getting fixed. I'm not 100% sure because we don't make those flashes. Um, so some of it comes down to the timing between them. I will pass it up to the team though, uh, and see what I can, you know, kind of get as an answer from, from them. All right, back to this, uh, luminance levels, uh, on the camera. So we're back into looking at the menus, uh, luminance levels, you have your full range, uh, and then your two limited ranges here. Uh, really 
this is going to depend on how you want to work with the footage, where you're going to be putting it in, how you're going to be working with it in, in software. Uh, 0 to 1023, you got to be careful with if you're shooting video because there are certain situations where you may capture it in 0 to 1023 and then you go bring it into your software or load it up onto YouTube and realize that your shadows are totally crushed and your highlights are really massively clipped. Um, this just gives you that control over these different uh, uh, ranges that the footage should be in. Um, when we get into... Um, when we get into the AF detection settings here, uh, you've got a couple things that you can do here. AF detection settings on or off. So this just turns on whether or not the camera is going to be using detection modes. Uh, your different subjects, animal, eye, human. Uh, if you want to learn more about these, we did have uh, streams uh, near the launch of the camera about these in particular. Uh, AF custom settings for video. Uh, we've talked about the photo ones, uh, but... These are how you can adjust the responsiveness or the locked on nature of the focusing solution. Um, you've got uh, sensitivity and speed. Now, one thing I'm going to caution here. Um, if you are just getting into the camera and you're coming from DFD solutions into this new face system, do not just immediately punch in your settings that you used on the DFD solution here. Um, because... If you do that, you're using something that was designed to work on a contrast-based solution, so adjustments that you made, but now you're using a phase detect solution, which is much faster. Uh, anytime you, you're going to work with something like this, start everything at zero, do some tests, see what you don't like, maybe where you want to see it tweaked a bit, then go and change it. Don't just blindly apply settings from, you know, like the, the older cameras, uh, and then kind of go from there to see as I start recording on the camera. Um, let's see here on the S5 II, can the tracking algorithms you use be tweaked via firmware, uh, like AF in the past tracking seems to lose subjects at times. Uh, yeah, everything in, in the tracking algorithms can always be updated because that is software based. Um, please shutter information electronic. Uh, okay. Yep. We're going to get into that one. Uh, the most pressing upgrade for G is not lenses, but to provide upgrade bodies of PDAF for G, it's not a uh, current lens roadmap. The most obvious upgrade is to redesign the 35 to 100 to eight into 35 to 100. Uh, oh, okay. I see what you're talking about. All right. Uh, focus limiter, uh, focus limiter. We have the option to come in and manually tell the camera, you know, the distances that you want the system to work in. Uh, AF continuous. This is one that... Um, this is one that, that I think by default, when you look at it, uh, you're going to be in mode one out of the box. What this means is that continuous AF is only going to work when the camera is actually recording. So if you're someone who uses the camera for streaming, like I do, you want to make sure that you turn the camera into mode two for continuous AF. This will allow the system to actually run even when you're not recording video. So in standby. Now, you want to be a little careful with this because there are some times where, you know, if you're someone who leaves your camera on all the time and you sling it around your shoulder and you just let it go while you're working, mode two can cause situations where you're constantly running the focus. So that increases, you know, battery draw that because you're using the camera as if you were recording, that's not necessarily standby mode anymore. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you go through with, you know, continuous focus studio use. It's awesome. Um, because I can leave it up and I can move and do everything I need and not have to worry about the system. Uh, AF assist lamp, uh, it's more for the photo, uh, photo side. Uh, focus peaking, uh, the focus peaking solution has been changed in this camera a little bit. Uh, if you've never used uh, focus peaking in our cameras. Uh, sensitivity is now a plus two minus two uh, option where before it was high, high and low. Um, the higher the sensitivity, it means the finer the peaking is going to look on the screen. It does not mean the easier it's going to be able to see. It means that it's more accurate. So it means that it's looking at a smaller uh, definition of the edge for focus. Lower value means that the, it's going to allow it to use a wider area. So it'll be easier to see, but less accurate. Zero is default. Uh, display color, tons of different colors now. It's all within one uh, particular uh, menu here. Pick the one that works best for your eyesight. Um, that's really the best advice I can give on that. Uh, display during AFS in the photography side. If you're in AFS, you have pressed the shutter. Locks focus. It'll overlay peaking. Uh, and then display during MF, you've got a couple different controls here. When shutter is pressed, 
when live view is enlarged or just when you are in live view. So you got a different, a couple different controls now for determining when focus peaking is showing on the camera. Uh, let's see here. One area moving speed. This is just how fast the uh, reticle moves across the frame. Uh, you have all your sound levels here. Um, and wow, I'm only, I'm not even through the whole thing yet. Um, let's wait for audio for, uh, let's wait for audio a little bit later because we just went through the video selections. Um, the other, uh, the last couple of things here when it comes to video use cases, um, image stabilizer. Image stabilizer on this camera's got a couple different modes. You've got normal auto, which is gonna uh, automatically detect if you're panning and disable the, op uh, the opposite uh, correction. So if you're in, in auto, in lenses that apply to it, so this is with a dual IS lens, uh, if I start to pan, it'll disable the left-right stabilization and only compensate vertical. Uh, if I pan up and down, it'll disable the left-right, or it'll disable the up-down and only use left and right, so you don't get the, that jerkiness uh, in the footage. It depends on the lens you're using, whether or not it has it, um, and it, because it needs more communication than just, I've got a lens attached. Uh, when to activate, in video, this will always be set to always. In photo, out of the box, it's set to half press. If you want it on always, go into this menu from a photographer's perspective and just change it to always. Um, this means that the footage will always be stable while you're looking through the viewfinder without having to half press the uh, shutter button. Uh, electronic stabilization in video, you'll notice electronic stabilization does have a slight crop on the image, just like pretty much all of them do. Um, E-stabilization uh, will get you a little bit better control if you're going to be doing a lot of moving and handheld walking. Um, this allows you to be able to uh, just basically really get a super stable piece of footage um, while you're kind of moving if you've got it, you know, running, stuff like that. Um, this is part of where the active IS solution kind of comes from. Um, Boost IS, uh, this is the, basically it turns your video image stabilization into uh, more like a still stabilization where uh, that's really where most of the SEPA ratings come from is the still side. There is no rating for the video side. So Boost IS means that it's going to lock off like a monopod or tripod-ish type shot. But the trade-off is that when you move with the camera, you try to pan with it, it's going to try to hold that spot really hard. So then if I move and I get to the edge of where the stabilization can really work, it's going to jump back into the frame and kind of move with you. So you can get a little bit more jittery look uh, with Boost IS if you are panning. If you are just trying to stay stable, this is a really good spot to go to. Uh, and then anamorphic stabilization. This is if you're using anamorphic lenses. Um, there is uh, stabilization tuned in the camera based on the squeeze factor of the lens that you're working with. So from 2, 1, 8, 1, 5, 1, 3, 3, and 1, 3, 0. Oh. Um, you would only select these if you're using anamorphic lenses. Um, don't use these if you're not because of the way that it tunes the system for, uh, particularly for anamorphic lenses. Uh, focus transition. Um, this allows you to be able to come in, set different uh, focus points. So if I manually focus on the um, Steam Deck here, I've got a point here that I want to select. And then I can uh, program this in and program in uh, preset focus pulls uh, with this. Uh, we did talk about this in one of the previous videos. So after this is posted, I will link um, that in the uh, uh, description or in, in a card for the video. Uh, loop recording. If you're someone who's going to use your camera more as, uh, you know, kind of ob observational work or a really, really, really high end dash cam. You could use loop record. Uh, this basically, once it gets to the end of the storage, it will then start overwriting the earlier uh, content. Uh, segmented file recording. This allows me to come in and say I want one minute segments, three, five, or ten. Uh, this can be great if you're someone who's actually using the camera and you're doing really, really long takes, but you want to make sure that you've got, you know, maybe more bite-sized pieces so that you're not having to scrub through, say, an entire 96 gig file. Um, you can come in here and tell the camera I want, you know, a time-limited uh, segment for each video. And then last but not least for the video side, live cropping, 20 to 40 seconds. Uh, we've talked about live cropping before. This allows me to come in here. I've got two zones selected. If I hit record, the camera is going to pull out here from the zone that I selected in a certain time zone. 
or time frame and gives me a pan and zoom look in the camera without me having to actually do this in post. Uh, the cool thing with the S5 Mark II is that when you have the camera set in the 6K uh, or 5.9K options, you can do this in 4K. Um, yeah, it gives you just a really, really cool um, setup there. Uh, oops, sorry. That's my bad. Uh, all right, let me take a look at some of the chats here. Uh, for tracking, uh, where was I? Thinking of getting a Mark II X for the ProRes, but can you record ProRes directly to an external SSD? Or is that functionally functional functionality limited to other formats? Do I need a specific type of SSD? Um, so, yeah, the uh, ProRes... Um, yeah, you, you, you are going to need an external SSD if you want to do things like uh, 4K ProRes, uh, stuff like that out from the camera. Um, as far as um, the specific SSDs, when the camera is, uh, when the rest of the details of the camera are released, um, we should have a list of formal SSDs that are validated. Uh, we do have that list available for the GH6. Uh, if you go onto our uh, service and support site, we do have all that information available. Um, but yeah, that th th there will be SSDs that are recommended. Um, we do this in particular because as we test SSDs that are, you know, may claim that they're okay to work with, you run into a lot of like power consumption issues and other things like that. Um, the SSDs that we state are validated, at least when I'm referencing the GH6, um, they've been tested. We know that they work. We know that you're not gonna have a problem with it. Um, and know that if you are using a non-validated SSD and you happen to have a problem and you contact us, we're, the first thing we're going to ask you is, what's the SSD you're using? Is it one that we have validated? Because we know what we can uh, troubleshoot there. If it's an SSD we didn't validate, we're probably going to turn around and tell you, well, we didn't validate that one, so we don't know. That probably could be the issue for it. Um, let's see here. Um... Uh, Renderman, so even you didn't try the S5 Mark II X. Uh, I have. Um, I just can't really give you guys any details. Um, let's see here. I, do, uh, I don't believe you touched on external recording for video at a lower cost. Good point. Um, so, when you look at... Uh, where's my monitors? The... <sighs> All right, so when it comes to external recording, because um, I didn't realize how long it was going to take me. This was poor time planning on my, my side. Um, when you want to get some sort of external recorder, right, uh, or you just want an external monitor to work with, you're not really interested in recording externally on the camera, um, you really, there's, there's really only a couple of things that you want to kind of, you know, really be you know, kind of paying attention to, right? Um, higher end monitors, like I have a video assist, uh, 12G here. I also have, um, my Ninja five right off camera as well. The benefit you get with these guys is that one, they're designed for recording. So the HDMI specifications that they use, the way they communicate to the camera is, is pretty much a, a, a good standard. You know that when you plug this in and I'm got my camera set to 4k, it knows it's going to take that, set it up, good to go. Um, something that you want to, that seems to be coming apparent with monitors for external use, um, because there are a lot of them out there. There's high end ones, there's really low cost ones as well. One of the things that seems to be coming up is that you find some of these monitors that maybe not actually working properly on the HDMI specifications for the handshake to tell the camera, hey, these are the resolutions that I can accept and I can display. Now, what that means is that, say you've got your camera set up and you've got it in 4K 60p or 4K 30p, you plug it into that monitor and that monitor just keeps saying no input signal. So then you get frustrated, you have to go through the different settings, you start, you know, you reset, you start playing around with stuff, you change cables, all that kind of stuff. Those are hidden problems with basic low-end monitors, inexpensive monitors um, that, that you, you, you probably will run into if you're looking at lower-end uh, inexpensive monitors. Um, because they don't tell the camera, these are the frame rates and resolutions I can accept, the camera doesn't know what to do for the output, and it basically just says, hey, um, here's the 4K 60p 10-bit signal, 
figure it out. The monitor doesn't know, so it doesn't tell the camera. Um, outside of that, really, you don't really have to worry too much about, um, you know, the, the, the monitors themselves. There's a lot of good ones that have good uh, tools, that have good, um, you know, just kind of capabilities. Uh, panel quality will become a little bit of a challenge, so you want to look at what quality panel they're using. Um, even in the higher-end monitors, like this Blackmagic versus the, uh, the Ninja 5, there are lots of conversations back and forth about which is better, which has better, you know, display quality, stuff like that. Um, you will run into those conversations in lower-end monitors as well. But if recording is something that you're looking at doing, um, this really just kind of comes into one, recorders are not going to be cheap. Um, depending on which camera you have, if you have an S5 Mark II and you want to do things like ProRes RAW, potentially, um, for one, at this particular point, it's just the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus, so you can't even go to an Atomos Ninja 5 at this point, from what I understand, from, uh, the Atomos lineup. Um, it's only going to be on the Plus, which means you're looking at, what, around seven or $800 for the monitor, I believe, um... Some of those values obviously change with promotions and stuff like that. Um, Black Magic, you're looking at, I think, around $600 for it. So actually, I think both the Plus and this are around... Well, the Plus and the Video Assist 5-inch are about the same price. So you're looking at a sizable amount of money to record here. Um, if you're on an older camera like an S5, um, S1 series, S1H, you can do an Atomos Ninja 5. You don't need the Plus. Um, you can use pretty much any recorder. It's perfectly fine. If you have no interest in RAW over HDMI at all, you can record on any of these monitors. You can pick up a Ninja 5. You could you could pick up, you know, some really old uh, Atomos recorders. Like, I have, like, a Shogun that I've got floating around. That would work perfectly fine, too, if all I want to record is ProRes, but not ProRes RAW. Um, yeah, other than that, I mean, monitors for external work, they're all going to be pretty much about the same across the board. It's just a matter of what tools you want to do with it and how far in advance you want to work with them. Um, yeah, so hopefully that uh, helped address a little bit of your question there. Uh, what is the best option for audio? Um, I'm biased, so um, my preferred audio solution is uh, Rode uh, Wireless Go 2s. Um, I use these things all the time. Uh, partially because, um, Rode sent them to me, uh, and I've been looking for these, but I've wanted them for a while. Uh, Rode sent them to me so I can play around with them, uh, test them with Lumix Live and stuff like that. Um, but I am a big lavalier, uh, fan for recording. Um, I do use, uh, a Rode, uh, studio mic here for, uh, these kinds of streams. But yeah, it just kind of, it just depends. Uh, internal microphones can be great for you as well. Um... Shotgun mics can be great for you as well. It just depends on your use cases. Um, let's see here. Uh, there was one question I wanted to get to here. Uh, that I, uh, Which gimbal would you recommend for the S5 Mark II X? Uh, truthfully, and that one, that question came from... Where was that? I just jumped past. Uh, I think it's Leo. Uh, Gimbal for S5 Mark II X or S5 Mark II or honestly any of the S5 platform. Um, I use the Ronin RSC2. Um, the RS3, RS3 Mini, RS was it RS3 Pro or whatever they're called now. Um, I have an I have more of an affinity for the DJI stuff. I bought my gimbal even though I rarely use it anymore. Um, if you do need one, they have the most tight knit integration for the camera. So active track is something that's built into the solution. So you can actually just plug the camera in with the USB cable uh, on my RSC2. If I've got face or body or human tracking, I just literally pull the trigger and the camera will track me as I walk around the gimbal. Um, so that's a really cool thing. Um, but you also get a lot of the control for uh, focus, iris, all that kind of stuff on those. Um, so yeah, those are probably any of the DJI gimbals I think are going to be some of the best ones to go with. Um, please talk about firmware 1.1. Um, I did talk about firmware 1.1 at the beginning of the stream, but as a recap, it is an update for, uh, live view display when you're half pressing the shutter, uh, for continuous AF in photo burst mode. Uh, this just changes the image quality, uh, preload in the camera. So you can either have it as a speed priority or as an image quality priority. 
Uh, basically speeds up the camera for uh, still shooters. Uh, let's see here. Uh, stop doing that. Um, all right. I just realized that we were at 2 o'clock. Uh, sometime, uh, okay, from Dave. I sometimes use AF buttons to get focus when in manual focus on the S5 II. Uh, is there a way of displaying the MF assist magnification without turning the lens focus ring? Uh, yes, there is. So last thing we'll show here. Uh, so one of the things that you'll notice is that if you go into the uh, cog menu, so this is the custom menu, under AF, uh, you'll see MF assist. You want to turn focus ring off. What this means is that if I put the camera into manual focus, and let me quit out of... Um, let me quit out of the uh, uh, live cropping mode here. Uh, so if I come down here, turn this to off, right? So right now I turned uh, the focus assist off for the lens so you don't see that uh, punch in. But if I come in here and I go back into the settings, MF assist, focus ring with lens on, um, and I have to, I may not have this set up to do it. Yeah. I don't have mine set up to do it because I don't have uh, punch in over HDMI. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, by turning lens off, uh, the lens option off there, uh, Dave, it's going to basically allow you to not have to have the punch in when you're using focus ring. It'll only activate when you, uh, in this case, in my case, when I hit the AF mode button. So that's pressing the um, uh, actual AF mode selection button there. Uh, cool. Um, beauty products. Lumix S5 II come with sound monitor channel play. Not sure what you mean there. Um, you can select which channel you want to uh, monitor. Um, but yes, it, it, it does. It has up to four channels if you use the uh, XLR1 audio adapter. Um... Do you know if uh, DJI RS series gimbals will eventually support Bluetooth for the S5 II? That I have no idea. I don't believe uh, it's in the plan right now. Um, I don't know if our Bluetooth protocol has everything needed for it. I don't know if they are working with our team on it. Uh, it's, it's above what I know. Right now, it's the cable connection. Um, but truthfully... I've experienced the Bluetooth control on the gimbals before, and I have actually had them bug out numerous times. I give me the option between Bluetooth, just because it's slick and cool, and a hardwire cable. I'm selecting the hardwire cable every single time, no questions anymore, uh, for my own personal use. Um, you can't have Bluetooth getting interfered with and cause a problem in the middle and then bugging your gimbal out. Um, cool. All right, so... Uh, we are going to next week, actually, probably because uh, I didn't realize how long it was going to take to get through this. Uh, next week, we're going to probably talk about the photo side of the menus and stuff like that. I know for some of you that tuned in uh, more about the, the photo side. Um, yeah, stream just uh, an, an hour is a lot less time than I had really kind of figured for this. Uh, but yeah, we will be back um, next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. We are going to talk about... Some of the menu stuff, uh, if you have specific questions that you want to know uh, from how to use the system and what the menu options mean, uh, let me know in the comments of this video afterwards. Uh, this way I'll, I'll write them down. I'll get uh, kind of more of a, a, a guide there for it. Um, but yeah, um, everybody, yeah. So outside of that, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, I know this was a little bit different than the normal, not as much... I, I tried to still get some back and forth in it, but maybe not as much as uh, usual. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I said, we'll be back next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Sorry, I got to cut it uh, relatively short today, but do have another meeting. I have to actually be in after this. So um, yeah, outside of that, see everybody next week. Hope you have an awesome weekend. And uh, yeah, if you like the video, like it, subscribe, hit the bell icon, all that fun stuff. We're back to doing that on YouTube now. So all right, everybody, take care. Have a good weekend.